Well, our second text today is we're continuing in the, in the book of James, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Let's listen for God's word through the book of James. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes and also comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor, you say, stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that has been evoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it does not, if it has no works, is dead. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. In this challenging second chapter of James, we have a lecture with far-reaching implications for our life of faith. It raises major questions, like it invites we believers to examine our relationship with one another, particularly relations among class lines. It challenges our understanding of the role of the Old Testament, like the Ten Commandments in Christian life. And last but not least, it challenges our understanding of the relationship between faith and action. James presents some very meaty material. Now, James is not easy on us or for us. And he does not necessarily give us clean answers as much as he asks us to consider the right and challenging questions. He wants us to think. You may recall in last week's reading, we were admonished not to become stained by the world. In this reading, James quickly moves into an example of being stained by the world by the practice of discrimination and by showing favoritism. Let's be clear. This is not a challenging of faith of the Christians and, and not a challenge to the power of Christ. It was not an issue of doctrine. This was a challenge to how Christians put their faith into action. We will bring, he will bring forth an example of discrimination against people by making value judgments based on unbiblical care criteria criteria such as race and class and culture, and subsequently acting inappropriately towards those persons. 
James makes his first point using a hypothetical example, an example that can be maybe too easily visualized by us even today. One that has been replicated many times in modern times as well, perhaps in ways we dread to face in our own real lives. Or maybe we are in situations that have become so common, we don't even recognize that we've taken some of these things or what has happened. Or like in the case of the rich man and the poor man, in James' actual example, <clears throat> we have allowed society to dictate how we respond. James' example, two people entering the community gathering. One is obviously rich, gold ringed man, flamboyant, dressed blatantly in his scarlet and gray regalia. The second is someone who appears lost, maybe confused, tired and worn, dressed in faded maize and blue, such a pedestrian way. James says we may treat them as the culture of the day would have expected and perhaps the culture of our day would be expecting. It is that you would give the first a seat of honor in the most prominent place while shuffling the second off to some less conspicuous place. James castigates us, says this type of discrimination is evil. Understand this is not talking about discrimination, discriminating action based on our understanding of God's word. This is not discrimination of right and wrong. This is discrimination where God would have his people show no partiality. Now, in this regard, some of you who know me may call me a hypocrite in this regard. Yesterday, I hung all four of my Big Ten flags across the front of the garage, representing the schools where I've been a student or a faculty member. Orange and blue, Illinois. Green and white, Michigan State. Maroon and gold, Minnesota. Scarlet and gray, Ohio State. Always in the middle. I would contend this is a statement of loyalty and pride in each of these institutions that has been important to my life and my career. I truly hope that it does not devolve into some type of discrimination based on perceived moral values or some implied thought about my understanding of God's word implying something that is right or wrong about my choices or those teams. We can ask, is this type of discrimination where God would have his people show no partiality? Do we sometimes drift over that line? I will say, I think it's okay to cheer on your team. It's okay to enjoy a gridiron battles that occur and spectacles they are. It's okay to have fun. Yesterday I went two for two. But please do not make God so small as to deem God involved in judging or some moral discrimination between teams. Now you might remember, James did not have sports teams as an example to use and the challenge of making inappropriate value judgments there. James example fits his context and invites reflection on what it means for us to love our neighbors especially those of a lower or different economic class than us. James' challenge expands and applies further to invite examination of how we treat all classes and categories of persons we create. In his writing, it is particularly those of with lower or less social power. In our day, we have many categories and challenges for us those many different categories, refugees and immigrants, children, people of color, and LBGTQ people, just to name a few of the categories we've created. Looking at the outside to determine a person or a set of person's worth or worthiness is not God's way. James' diagnosis is to have you ask the question of yourself 
have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, expanding, generalizing from his sample case, James goes, James goes on to invite the believers to consider questions of wealth, poverty, and justice in a, in a broader sense. Particularly, James reminds that God, in God's countercultural way, chose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Perhaps with an allusion back to Jesus' words in the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meanwhile, James takes pains to point out the irony that the rich unbelievers are often the very ones who persecute the Christians and blasphemy God, not the poor. Tony Evans, in his commentary, points out that this is not to be interpreted as all poor people are inherently saved and all rich people are inherently condemned. Rather, it's a simple acknowledgement that those who are destitute often recognize their need for a savior more readily. Likewise, those living proudly in wealth and comfort frequently misidentifying their need for God. Many would say that this characteristic of those in the greatest need and seeing and being willing to accept and proclaim their need for God helps explain the current rapid growth of the church in Africa and other developing areas. This assertion of James about the poor prompts self-examination, especially for those of us in the wealthy global north. For me, it raises two independent questions for reflection. First, have we allowed our wealth to mask our need for God in our lives? Second, what is our role in, op in oppressing the poor? Whether those be neighbors as near as next door or as far as continents away from, continents away from, where, from where we exist. All to what kind of repentance might God be calling us? I'll leave those two questions regarding our roles, our lack of vision and role in poverty for you to reflect on. Going on in his third movement in this very dense text, via a series of if clauses, James moves to argument of general principles, but still with a slant towards favoritism and discrimination in the law. You know, throughout the New Testament, what might be seen as different perspectives are taken on the law. In other places in the Bible, Paul argues that the law served as a tutor until Jesus came, but now we have Jesus as our guide. While Matthew argues that not one letter stroke from the law will disappear until all has been fulfilled. Very contrasting statement. In this text, James raises a question about the place and the role of law, the law of Moses, really meaning the Ten Commandments, within Christian life. Now, he seems to be addressing a very specific argument. It may be one that has come up to him through the people. The argument seems to be something like, well, I understand all the Ten Commandments, right? They're on the wall. And I think I should pass the test of these because I'm very good at some of them. For example, I'm sure I have not murdered anyone. I will admit, maybe not so good at some of the others, but on average, I'm doing okay. In school, if I could get 70% right, I would pass. Won't that work here? James' perspective would not allow this not allow a 70% pass, not allow discrimination or favoritism among the elements of the law. His vision would be more like the description I read about the law being like a log chain, each link being one of the laws. If you accept this metaphor of the log chain, then picture yourself hanging from a cliff by your log chain. 
it doesn't matter which link is the weakest or which link breaks because they're all connected together. The end result of the test will be the same. James says no favoritism and no discrimination even within the law. The last four verses of our text today includes a very familiar sounding statement that even if you do not know where it came from, seems familiar and can and has created great anxiety among believers. These, those words are, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. If this is all we read, it would seem to be a challenge to the assertion of Ephesians and other of Paul's letters that Christians receive salvation through God's grace rather than through human action. Paul in Ephesians says it this way, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works. And in Galatians, he says, a person is justified not by works of law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. How do we relegate these two? Well, Martin Luther sparked the Reformation based largely on the concept we are saved by grace, not by action. This is canonized in subsequent early works of the Reformed churches, like the Heidelberg Catechism we studied a few years ago, with its beautiful image of progression from guilt to grace to gratitude. We are all human and be, by definition sinful and guilty. We have received through life, death, and resurrection of Christ, grace, forgiveness of those sins by the grace of God. And finally, our actions are to be in gratitude for that gift, a gift we have no way to earn. However, our actions express gratitude, make one's faithfulness visible to all. The three G's, guilt, grace, gratitude. James' words call his audience to engage and enact their faith based in gratitude, in a particular faith that attends to the physical needs of fellow community members. Today's message from James challenges us to consider by what actions we make our faith visible. Challenge challenges us to think through how we put our faithful words into action. Indeed, faith in action encapsulates this entire chapter of James. James challenges us to consider how we will live out our faith together in ways that reflect God's mercy and benefit the marginalized. As we continue over the next few weeks, our travel through James, I hope that this text for today will help us remember to treat all people of God as God's own, as God would, no matter what race or religion or nationality. We are all God's creation and need God's help. Likewise, God wants us in gratitude for grace to join in meeting the needs of all God's people wherever we find them. May it be so. Amen.